Hello guys, and welcome back to another CAFCAST! Today we are doing something that is becoming a bit of a trend on the CAFCAST. We're going to be talking hardware and we're going to be talking tech. Today I'm going to be teaching you guys how to build a PC that is designed for gaming and for making YouTube videos, but in one computer. A lot of people like me don't like to have multiple computers for files to get mixed up and, and put all over the place. So I wanted to show you guys this new computer that I've designed specifically for the task of running the channel uh, and also hopefully to be able to get some really good gaming performance out of it. The one thing that you might have noticed that is missing in the current lineup here with the case, the motherboard, the CPU cooler, the power supply, the fans and obviously the SSDs, the M.2 drive and the, the CPU at the front here is the graphics card. That's because I'm going to be using my existing graphics card because I'm not finding that I'm able to uh, ever have any problems running 1080p at 60 FPS. And there's also a new 9 series graphics card coming out very, very soon from Nvidia. So for now, we're going to stick with 780, but everything else is absolutely brand new for the system, which is absolutely fantastic. We're going to be taking a look at everything step by step for you as well. Uh, there'll be individual review videos for each of these products if you want to look a bit more in depth about each part of this system. Uh, but this video that you're watching right now will go through the rundown of why I chose each specific component and uh, all the different things that you can get if you don't have enough money or you want an alternative as well. Uh, and then finally we're going to build the system and then do some benchmarks to see exactly how well it runs. So stay tuned guys, let's get started. So one of the first things that I decided that I knew I wanted to get was this case. This is the Fractal Define R5. If you want to watch my unboxing and review of this case, you can check it out on the screen now or in the description below if you're a mobile user. It's one of the better silent and cooling performing cases or it's one of the better cooling performant silent cases on the market because silence whilst you're recording is one of the more important things to bear in mind. And it also supports 140mm fans rather than 120 which is another reason that I wanted to go for this case. 140mm fans are going to have a lot more throughput of air or static pressure than 120mm fans. So for example, we have a 120mm fan here and we have a 140mm fan here. If I just quickly show you guys, you can see exactly the, the difference in size between these two. And a lot of cases out there don't actually support 140mm because they're not wide enough. So this is a 140mm fan that you can see here. And I will compare that next to one of the Silencios from Cooler Master that I've got here. So it doesn't sound like a large difference in terms of size. But as you can see, it's quite a significant difference. And when you've got these fans running at, let's say, 1500 RPM or even 1200 RPM, whatever it is that you decide to run on them, uh, they want to be pushing a lot more air through something like this than something like this. So that's the other reason why I went for this case. So the next thing I'm going to talk to you guys about is the motherboard. And the choice that I've made is the Asus. X99 Deluxe. Now, there are quite a lot of boards out there for X99 systems, various different brands. The reason that I've gone for an Asus board today was because I've already used Asus boards and have used Asus boards in a number of builds that I've done so far in my life, and I've found that these seem to be very reliable. I've never had any problems with an Asus motherboard, so personally, I feel like I can recommend them to you guys. Now, the reason why I went for the Asus Deluxe board was that there was a number of additional benefits that you get on this board in comparison to the X99A, the X99S, or even the uh, the Pro as well. There's uh, essentially a, a, the wireless uh, support and extra uh, ability for some additional SATA ports and, uh, and various different little bits and pieces like that stand this board out from the A and the S. Uh, now, I don't usually use wireless uh, systems but it is nice to have especially in places where perhaps I can't get onto a wired ethernet system uh, so I went for this board over the pro 
basically because it was only about £30 more, about sort of $50, $60 more, um, which is not a significant amount of money uh, by any stretch of the imagination. The wireless card in this one seemed to have uh, three connections, a three-port connection for wireless signal connectivity, whereas the Pro seemed to only have two. Now, I'm not exactly sure the significant benefits of that, but it seems like this uh, wireless card on this system was built with more reliability in mind. And when I'm doing large uploads for long periods of time, the most important thing for me is to make sure that my reliability is really high up there. The other thing uh, that this board has, speaking of reliability, is a lot of really high-end chokes and capacitors, uh, some really nice thermal dissipation heat sinks on some of the more vital components on the board. Um, and it just seems to be something really, really worth taking a look at. And, uh, and obviously it has got the five-way optimization built in as well, which means that I can automatically overclock my uh, motherboard here, my CPU, um, and also be able to intelligently optimize the fans that I'm using as well, which as I said before, are all the same. Um, and a various couple of other things like the Digi Plus uh, power support management, TFU things, like that. So we're going to be uh, actually taking a little bit of a look into this in more depth and if you want to see uh, a longer video about this there is an unboxing video uh, that you guys can go and check out right now on the screen now and also as I said before in the description. Each of the build parts of this process have their own separate videos for longer, longer unboxings if that's something that you want to see. Um, but essentially that's what it boils down to. Alternatives, if you don't want to spend £299 on a motherboard, that's absolutely fine. The X99 platform that we are building on is really significant in the fact that we need those processor cores on our CPU and you'll see that when we talk about the actual processor choice itself. Um, so we don't really have a choice but you can get uh, X99 platform motherboards for lower than £200, um, which is uh, quite a significant saving if you know you don't need the additional SATA ports, the additional SATA Express ports, the additional M.2 slots that this board has. It has one on a riser and another actually built straight into the board, which is the one that I'll be using both uh, times four as well. Um, which means that I can use the XP941 that I've chosen for this build, which again you'll see later on. Uh, but apart from that, you can look at the X99A of the ASUS boards. They all have some of the higher end components. They didn't skimp on any of these boards, so anything would be a good choice. Uh, it's just the Deluxe is something that I chose um, I felt that my system uh, would benefit from uh, and it's it, again it's like a personal choice for me I felt like this board would uh, would be the best kind of option in terms of uh, x99 platform support MSI do fantastic boards as well EVGA do fantastic boards as well but uh, for me personally I wanted to go with the Zeus because I have used the Zeus for a long time and I know that they are good so uh, yeah let's carry on So one of the things that is not going to have its own video on our series that we're going to be doing is the CPU. Uh, because there's not really much to unbox for you guys, but I can tell you a little bit about why we chose this processor. And there's also going to be an additional overclocking video, which is going to tell us a lot more about how this processor performs by checking, in fact, how effectively it overclocks. So uh, we'll have to keep our fingers crossed for the CPU lottery. This is the Intel i7-X99, the 5960X. It is the, uh, I believe it's the world's first octa-core uh, on the Enthusiast system, the 2011 uh, chipset system, which is fantastic because one of the main things that I wanted to talk to you guys about today is obviously we need to talk about gaming, uh, and gaming is, is graphics card and gaming in part, is to do with processor but the most important thing that we need to do as well uh, as gaming is video editing which obviously Adobe Premiere Pro um, is the software of choice for me other process other programs are available um, but genuinely I, I find that Premiere to, to be the most effective tool in my arsenal because I also get um, access to 
Audition and various other programs as well. Um, and essentially, the good thing about Premiere Pro is it will accept multiple cores. So the way to get the most effective performance in Premiere, apart from hard drives, and we'll talk about hard drives a little bit more later on, is the amount of cores that you have in your system. And obviously having eight cores in our system uh, is the most efficient thing that you can do on an enthusiast grade platform. We could go down the route of a Xeon systems, but unfortunately then you even get out of my price range. Uh, you have to be spending thousands and thousands of pounds to be able to get a dual CPU Xeon based system uh, on a workstation class uh, board, even an X99 workstation class board like the Asus uh, X99WS, which I haven't mentioned previously uh, on uh, other videos that we've been doing um, because it's a dual CPU board and is not something that you can do with these type of processors, they need to be Xeons. So uh, the, the actual processor itself generally does overclock pretty well and I've seen a number of people getting to a, a level of around about 4.5 gigahertz and even to 4.8 gigahertz. I'm going to essentially hope that 4.5 gigahertz is our sweet spot. I'd like to get to that kind of level on this board. Um, but as those, those among you who know about processors and who know about the processor lottery, uh, unfortunately, it's not a sure thing. Um, but we're going to do our best to get as close to there as possible by using the CPU cooler that we've chosen, which we'll see a bit more about a little bit later on. But one thing I wanted to also give a special mention to is the thermal paste we're going to be using for today's video. Now, thermal paste is one of those things that perhaps is slightly underlooked and essentially a lot of times, especially if people are using something like a, a liquid CPU cooler from Corsair, may not even purchase because a lot of coolers these days, as I said before, and to name a few, the Corsair series ones or the ones that I've used, already have thermal paste actually on the uh, the actual heat sink itself um, pre-applied so people tend to not really worry about applying it themselves but a good thermal paste can mean the difference between or under load it can mean the difference between 50 degrees and 45 degrees or even 60 degrees there there's no way of knowing but it is the thing that comes directly into contact with your processor and needs to be able to effectively dissipate heat as quickly as possible into the heat sink that you have chosen. Personally, I have gone for the IC Diamond CPU thermal paste. There should be a link in the uh, description for you guys to take a little bit of a, uh, a better look at it, but it is a uh, seven carat diamond thermal compound uh, with, in fact, I think it says on here, 92% uh, diamonds by weight and apparently um, it's just a much more effective uh, way of dissipating heat than silver or gold or anything else like that, any of those other types of metals. And hopefully uh, it's going to be able to do some very, very efficient things. I've seen some really nice performance numbers from it. Anything that I can do to get heat away from this processor as quickly as possible to achieve a more reliable overclock is good in my book. And it also has something crazy like a seven year kind of like turnaround for reliability. So you should find that you'll never actually need to replace it for the lifetime of the machine because that generally I would have moved on to a new system by then. But we'll have to wait and see. It might last for years and years and years to come. Who knows? Uh, but the CPU itself, um, we'll have a little look inside and see what it comes with because obviously I know that a lot of you guys will like to see bits and pieces like that. Um, we won't make a separate video for it because there's not much point in, uh, in doing that because all there is is a nice pretty picture, <laughs> a uh, instruction installation guide, a special offer for a McAfee trial and why anybody would do that I have no idea uh, and then finally the CPU itself is in this little piece of card here which we're actually not going to uh, it's actually obviously in a, in a piece of plastic right now which hopefully I can get out there we go there is the processor itself and hopefully I'll be able to give you guys a, a nice chance to have a look at that in more detail later on the 5960X hopefully is going to be able to perform well for us. It is the central uh, point to this system. 
um, and I'll be able to tell you how well it performs because I can compare it against my existing system which is an i7-4770K quad core so we should be able to find out exactly how much better something like this performs by building a project for both, both the actual computers themselves and find out which one performs the best so I'm hoping that that's going to be quite a good test so we'll have to wait and see but for now um, obviously once we've gone through the rest of the components of this build I'm going to plug this into the motherboard through the installation that you guys hopefully are going to see today and then uh, we'll go on from there so yeah let's carry on The next thing I wanted to talk to you guys about a little bit is storage and it is one of the other significant things that can mean a system is heavily bottlenecked and not able to perform as well as it can to be able to perform to its standard. Uh, and essentially what we have here is a couple of different SSDs that we're going to be using, a couple of different SSD technologies as well um, and we also have a third or rather fourth SSD currently in our existing system which we'll be talking about in more detail a little bit later on but that is also going to be used. Now essentially when you're building a system designed for YouTube videos there's two things that are important. Making sure that we have the fastest SSD possible for our boot drive which is why we've chosen a Samsung XP941 512GB M.2 X for SSD and yes that is a mouthful uh, I'll just quickly show you guys in here in fact there'll probably be a little bit of b-roll rolling as we speak but in case for any reason I forgot that's the actual chip inside there it's very very small and that's going to be going directly into our board uh, and we also have uh, some other drives which are designed to be able to take recording information as quickly as possible so the thing that you need to make sure that you have in your system, if you can, is three hard drives. I used two in my old system and two is an alternative which we'll be discussing later on. But the reason that you could do with three is this. The first drive that you need is a drive for your operating system and your programs. It's where all your games are going to be, it's where your operating system is going to be, it's where all your Adobe software is going to be, where all the main actual collections of applications are going to reside. It's important to make sure that's nice and quick so loading times are as short as they possibly can be and an M.2 SSD is going to be able to do that for us because it's a lot quicker than SSDs because it plugs directly into a PCI as opposed to the SATA 6G ports that you would normally use. The second drive that you need is a drive for your Adobe files. Now essentially what that means and we'll go into more detail about this once we're actually setting the system up and again there'll be a separate video for that to explain in more detail about how to set up the system correctly which you can check in the description or by clicking the link on the video hopefully right now if I've done my job uh, you have a, uh, a large amount of preview files, rendering files, audio preview files, clipping files um, and any additional stuff that the, the system desires to create. Say for example you wanted to add an echo to an audio file and edited it in Adobe Audition. Premiere would automatically put that file in this location. It's a place where you, it's called a scratch disk and essentially what you do is you place all of your Adobe files that it needs on this drive. It's important to make sure, however, that the drive is just on its own because that needs to be able to be accessed, a load and save as quickly as possible. So that's the drive that I currently don't have in my system. I have two. I have a, a RAID set up for my recording, but it's also my, uh, my drive for my scratch disk. And I found that that has significantly impacted my performance um, on the system which is a, a, a real shame. The final drive that you need and the place where you really need to get a large amount of storage is in your recording drives. Now personally for me I've gone with two one terabyte 850 Evos. They have a good warranty, uh, they're expected to last for a good amount of time and also I'm going to put them in a RAID 0. Now uh, just to be really, really quick about RAIDs, uh, RAID 1 is when two drives are saving the same information. RAID 5 is where you have more uh, drives in sort of multiples doing what RAID 1 does and what RAID 0 does together. So, for example, if you had 
uh, let's say four hard drives, then two of those would be mirrored and two of those would be running side by side to give you more storage. Um, RAID 0 is what we're doing and that's basically doubling these drives up to be accessed at any point that an application requires them. Uh, so essentially there's going to be two terabytes worth of free space available but it'll be able to be accessed quicker than a single two terabyte drive would be able to give. So that's for 1080p and potentially in the future 4K footage at 60 frames per second or even higher. I aim to do 120 frames per second super slow motion video uh, in games to be able to get some really high quality content out to you guys, which is again a plan for, and one of the reasons why I'm building this computer in itself. But that's essentially it. You need a drive for your operating system, you need a drive for your scratch disk, and you need a drive for your recording software like Bandicam, for example, which is what I use. Um, once you have these three, you should find that you're not bottlenecking your system by the amount of drives that you're using, whereas if you were using one, uh, you definitely are bottlenecking your system, and if you're using two, then you do have still the potential to be bottlenecking your system depending on how you set everything up. So, uh, for now, that's it. There's videos of the unboxings of the Samsung drives. Uh, there's no reason to have an unboxing video of the Samsung XP941 because you've seen uh, exactly what it is um, and exactly what the, uh, the unboxing experience is like. It's in a brown box. There's not much more I can do about that. And then by the end of this video, again, hopefully we will have these connected in and plugged into a system. So uh, we'll carry on. So memory, as we know, is pretty important, especially when working with large projects and large video files, because it does take up a lot of RAM to be able to run those things optimally and also output files efficiently and quickly. Not having enough RAM is definitely a very, very bad thing. The regular ATX size boards that you can find in the X99 chipset platform can max out at 64 gigabytes worth of RAM. Uh, if you choose an eATX board like the ASUS uh, WX, uh, WS sorry, or the uh, ASUS ROG the Republic of Gamers board, which is also an eATX board as well as MSI and EVGA equivalents, you'll find that they can actually go up to 128 gigabytes because they have the lanes to support it on the eATX board. Um, however, we don't, and uh, we are essentially going to be trying to max out the amount of memory that's available on this system as soon as possible. But for now, we are using quad-channel DDR4, which is extremely expensive, so we've already spent quite a lot of money on memory as it is. We've gone for the crucial ballistics sport ddr4 32 gigabytes of memory here that we have it's four sticks of eight gigabyte there are eight slots on the motherboard itself so we will be updating the board to its maximum available 64 gigabytes as and when we feel like we are outperforming the memory itself uh, essentially when we move into the 4k realm uh, which is one of the reasons that we are upgrading at the moment um, as you guys hopefully have been told a number of times by now. Uh, the board is quad channel, so it will be able to support all four of these sticks running simultaneously, which is fantastic. And these were surprisingly well priced for DDR4. They do have an overclocking profile. Um, they run at DDR4 2400, which apparently on the DDR4 X99 platform overclocking your RAM doesn't make a significant difference or doesn't doesn't make as significant a difference as, as previous chipsets have but uh, it's still nice to have a small overclocking profile that's built into the RAM itself which you know it's guaranteed to be able to run at so we will run that OC profile um, for these four sticks and for now 32 gigabytes of RAM going straight into the board and we will upgrade that to 64 gigabytes as and when once again no video for these guys because it's just a pop box with uh, these four sticks in and I'll just open this to show you guys um, exactly what they look like in case anybody out there is dying to find out or can't see from the video that I've been showing you um, but as you can see essentially they are just nice black PCBs to match the Zeus X99 Deluxe that we've been running with some 
I'd I'd probably call them basic. They I think that's probably the best way of putting it. Um, it's not the most attractive wording, and I'm sure that Crucial wouldn't agree with me when I use that kind of word. But it's a basic heat spreader, a basic aluminum heat spreader. It it probably isn't effectively doing a significant amount of work to dissipate heat, but essentially in, in such a well ventilated system, we don't need to worry about that too much. And I didn't have the additional. It was, I think it was for, to get 32 gigabytes of the next up, the Dominator series of the of the Crucial. Memory was something crazy, like an extra hundred pounds, just for the pleasure of having a slightly larger uh, heatsink with the same amount of performance as well. The same the same two four hundred uh, on the on the frequency of the memory. So I thought that wasn't worth doing. So we've gone for this, and it will be going straight into the system. So make sure you stay tuned and watch to the end of the video to see that built in as well. Um, so yeah, we'll carry on. So the CPU cooler that we've decided to go for in this case, we only had a few options for, and thankfully Cooler Master very kindly provided us with this one to try out in the system itself. It's a 280 millimeter radiator, which essentially means that it is designed to be able to run with two or potentially even four if we decide to do a push-pull configuration as opposed to fans singly pulling air through the radiator or pushing air through the radiator, which we have the option of doing either we haven't quite decided until I actually plug everything in to which way we decide to do that but I'm thinking about push pull at the moment um, with the, uh, the the system though we only have the ability to to run or we have the maximum potential to run a radiator that has the ability to have two 140 millimeter fans and Corsair do one cooler master do one I think there is one out by another company as well that I can't think of off the top of my head but it's not essentially important because that's not the one that we decided to go with and they're all very similarly priced as well and then believe it or not they all perform similarly well as well there's a few reasons why I went for the cooler master one over some of the others the tubing that it has on the uh, the actual um, cooler as well uh, itself actually it's specifically designed it's called a double FEP, as I'm just reading off the top of this box here, double FEP tubing, uh, which is a lot easier if I just literally show you guys. It's kind of, um, for lack of a better word, ribbed um, for, for your pleasure as opposed to her, unless it's a, a girl building this computer, in which case then fantastic, that works both ways, doesn't it? Uh, for less dissipation or evaporation of the liquid inside the actual cooler itself. So theoretically, it should last longer which is great it doesn't have any thermal paste on the actual block itself but we'll take it out and have a little look on a video that you guys can click on right now on the screen or in the description for to find out more about what this comes with uh, but the alternatives as i said before i will tell you guys about you can look at uh, anything that, that is done by cooler master um or well the cooler master is, is what this one is obviously as i said before um, but you also have the option to use something by Corsair or by some uh, other companies. And essentially what it is, is you need to make sure that your case, the case that you choose, um, is able to support the uh, this um, CPU cooler itself. If not, Cooler Master do a really fantastic 240M, which is designed to be able to take two or again potentially four 120mm fans uh, and if you're using something like their Silencio Static Pressure SP120s, SP stands for Static Pressure, um, which actually fit really nicely onto that radiator essentially, there will be a video, because I have one ready to go on this uh, on this channel very, very soon, on a 4770K, and you can see how well that performs. So uh, make sure you stay tuned for that. Um, but as I said before, there's a link to this uh, video right now on the screen or in the description if you want to go and find out more about exactly what this is and what we are looking at and uh, if not then carry on watching and we will have this CPU cooler built into the system in no time. The last thing that I wanted to talk to you guys quickly about calling before we move on is the fans that I'm using to call the CPU and the system are the same. We're using seven, or we have seven, I'm not sure if we're actually going to use seven, we're probably more likely to use six and have one spare in case one blows up. 
six of the NFA14 PWM fans by Noctua. Now you've already seen them in detail a couple of times and if you haven't on this video then you should definitely check out a couple of the unboxing videos that we've been doing, uh, especially the one that I did about the CPU cooler because there was some more information about them in there. But essentially they are fans that have a very very good level of static pressure so they can move air very quickly into and out of a system and also be able to move air, move air very very effectively through a radiator like the radiator that we have for our CPU cooler. So they are very very efficient and uh, they're going to be very very useful. Hopefully they're going to perform in a very very nice way. They can go up to 1500 RPM but obviously they won't be doing that unless the computer is for some reason getting extremely hot. They're more likely to run a lot lot lower than that and hopefully because we have so many fans that are so large 140 millimeters we're going to be able to run a system that is hopefully very very cool and very very quiet at least that's what i'm going for so uh we'll have to wait and see let's get carried in And finally, the last thing we're going to be talking to you guys about before we actually build the computer is the power supply. And today we're going for the Cooler Master V1200 Platinum. This is an 80 plus platinum power supply and it's probably overkill, overkill, overkill for the system that we are building. Uh, but Cooler Master sent one over for us to use in this X99 build so uh, we may as well check it out. Um, because it's here and I wanted to get a power supply that had a platinum level grade on it. We essentially, and you essentially, would be able to get away with something more in the range of an 800, 850 watt power supply. And even that is never going to be actually used because it's still a significant uh, amount of wattage that it can actually achieve. But the cool thing about something like this is that under the 10% threshold, the fan will not kick in. So hopefully that means that when this computer is idle, it is going to be even quieter, which is a, a significant benefit. It is modular, as you guys can see on here, and uh, it has a couple of benefits, including 100% Japanese capacitors, which means that they are of a high grade and have been built to a high efficiency and obviously we all know that efficiency means reliability so hopefully we're going to cause no problems with it at all if you want to see more detail about the power supply and unboxing video and those kind of bits and pieces click on the screen right now or in the description there is a link to the video which goes into more depth and unboxes this but until Later, I think this is now the point where we're going to be moving into the unboxing if I've edited this video properly and we'll have to wait and see whether or not that's true because this is the first time I've done something on the, of this magnitude. Uh, so yeah, um, essentially stay tuned and we're going to start building this computer. We'll go through the process step by step and I'll be showing you guys everything as we go uh, along the way. So uh, this should be really, really exciting. Let's, uh, let's get stuck in, shall we?
So, there we go. Everything's been sorted, everything's been installed. I hope you guys have enjoyed this little how to build a YouTube PC series. I wanna just quickly touch on a couple of things that you can change if you'd like to, to lower the uh, the cost of the system. Uh, for example, if you are just starting out in YouTube. Personally, uh, if you are just starting out, I spent probably the first year of my channel, uh, maybe a little bit less than that, perhaps the first eight to 10 months of my channel, working on a MacBook Pro. So it doesn't by any means mean that you necessarily have to get a system like this. Um, this is just an example of what would be an ideal setup for working with YouTube. So we've set up our hard drives. We have our RAID array configured, which is really, really nice. We have two terabytes worth of recording space. 256 gigabytes on a separate SSD for our scratch disk for Premiere Pro. We also have the M.2 SSD running with the actual operating system itself. And in fact, that has been very, very efficient, very, very good. If you guys would like to see some benchmark numbers on those, I'm more than happy to provide them if you'd like to see. But we are running really efficiently. And hopefully, through the games that we're going to be running, uh, you'll be able to see that our loading times have been just absolutely cut completely. Now, hopefully, for example, GTA 5 should run really, really fast and load up for us like in next to no time, which is a, a fantastic thing. Uh, but in terms of saving money, you would be able to go for a two hard drive option. I wouldn't recommend going for a single hard drive. You want to have at least one drive for your operating system and one drive for your recording uh, because you don't want the two to be mixed up because whilst you're recording something, if your hard drive starts loading a new level or something, it can dip the performance of your recordings and even you can lose frames based on that. So make sure you've got at least two hard drives. Don't have to be SSDs. One of the best things to do in terms of RAID arrays, what I did with my original system, was ran two Western Digital RED hard drives for my second setup at an SSD, the 256 gigabyte SSD that is inside this system as my OS, and then two uh, Western Digital REDs in a RAID array for the recording drive, which worked very, very well, in fact, for a, for a long time. But we have obviously upgraded now that the CAFCAST is starting to gain traction, which I'm super excited about. The processor as well, you won't need to go for an 8-core if you don't want to, but cores are pretty vital. And if anything, at this point, if you can only afford certain parts and can want to skimp on things later on, I'd certainly recommend getting a faster processor or, a, or an 8-core processor rather than a 6-core processor if you can afford it as your primary place of purchase. The graphics card and things like that can always be upgraded in an interim uh, later on, but the processor, the thing that's actually going to make a difference to the amount of time it takes you to render videos is the processor. Obviously the graphics card is very much entirely dependent on the games that you play and I can only recommend the fact that I'm using a 780 and still able to max out GTA 5 at 60 frames per second 1080p um, and still get a consistently fantastic frame rate which you can check out on the channel if not now in the next couple of days to see exactly how well that game is running because it looks incredibly good. The other things that you could do to save a bit of money, uh, the RAM I got is pretty much as low as I would go because um, I, I prefer to go with brands that I trust, like Crucial, for example. Um, but you can go with a lower uh, lower brand that perhaps will be as reliable for you. Um, there's no way of knowing without actually trying, but brands like G Skill do have a, uh, a lower price point for you for the same amount of memory, so you could try looking there. Um, for something that's perhaps a bit cheaper. DDR4 memory, however, unfortunately at the moment is still quite expensive, so there's not much you can do about that. The other things that you can do though to save money if you do want to uh, is you can get yourself a smaller power supply uh, and in fact if you have the option to recycle an existing PK PC case that you have temporarily that's always a viable option for you as well. Recycling parts that you have from your old system like I have done with the graphics card and one of the SSDs that I'm running is probably the best thing that you can do to save some money uh, because obviously the X99 platform is quite expensive. I would say if you are struggling to afford to get onto the X99 platform it is pretty vital to be able to get on there because the more cores the better for you and if you are thinking about doing this properly if you've had a youtube channel for a while if you're just starting out it's not worth spending this kind of money but if you have a youtube channel for a while and are looking to build a, a pc that is specifically designed for the task at hand 
an x99 platform is fine and if you can only afford to get the six core processor then do that that's absolutely fine it's still miles better than getting a quad core system uh, so i think that would be a significant upgrade to you one of the really cool things that we managed to do with our system as well is actually overclock it and we have a 4.3 gigahertz overclock running on all eight cores of our 5960X, which I'm very happy with. I could probably push it a bit further if I wanted to because the system was able to run a 4.4 and I think even a 4.5 on the four core uh, test that it does before. It does a four core and it does an eight core test. Um, but to be honest with you, I didn't want to risk it because the 4.3 gigahertz over all eight cores is actually viable for 100% CPU usage on all eight cores for at least 15 minutes. So I am very happy with that. I know that that is a decent level of performance so I can consistently use that and hopefully that means that for going forward in the future we'll be able to use some, perhaps even some different, different overclocks and stuff but for now I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident with how that's gone. Anyway, thank you very much for watching guys. Don't forget to check out in the description there are loads and loads of videos that go alongside this series in looking in more depth about the different components that we've used for our build today. If you want to check out any of the reviews, they are all available on the uh, on the description right now and obviously on the channel as well they're all coming out as independent videos so make sure that you check them all out to make sure that you're happy with the the bits and pieces that I've chosen don't forget to like this video and any subsequent ones that you watch if you're enjoying the content that I'm putting out. We are just starting up here as a hardware channel with obviously games and stuff that we're doing uh, alongside that. So if you have any feedback for us or if you want to let us know about any good points or bad points or anything else that you'd like to see, then please do make sure that you leave a comment in the description below. Uh, and always don't forget to subscribe. Thanks guys. See you soon. You've been watching the Gaffcast. We hope you have enjoyed the show. Don't forget to check out all of our other videos. Oh, and be sure to subscribe to us if you like what you see. That way I'll know to make more and that you really like me. So, you've been watching the Gaffcast. We hope you have enjoyed the show. Don't forget to check out all of our other videos.